Airline pilots of Reddit, what was your biggest, we're all screwed moment that you survived and your passengers didn't notice? This was about seven years ago now. I took my brother and two cousins up for a short sightseeing flight one morning in a Cessna 172. I knew there was some weather coming in, so I wanted to get it over with quickly. About 20 minutes in, I noticed the clouds getting worse and then some lightning off in the distance. Definitely time to head back. Heading back, I radioed my intentions. Uncontrolled airport, but with an FBO. And someone radioed back with the current winds. It didn't compute what they said. And in retrospect, I should have asked for clarification. Get back to the airport, and as I'm on final, I realize just how bad the wind is. Having a hard time keeping on centerline and eventually go around on the first try. By now, I'm starting to sweat bullets, and planning on rerouting if the next attempt doesn't go well. I make sure to turn off the intercom so my cousins in the back can't hear how panicked I'm becoming, though I did keep my cool through the whole thing. On the second attempt, I've got the rudder pegged to the left and managed to get the wheels on the ground safely. I taxi to park, shut down, jump out, and start shaking with adrenaline and let out a huge sigh of relief. Cousins had no idea what just happened. To them, it was just an exciting flight. My brother kind of knew what was going on, and I let him in on what I was thinking later. Apparently, I had an audience of guys from the FBO watching me as well, probably yelling at me to go somewhere else. I'm honestly sometimes surprised that I managed that landing with no incident, especially since that was basically my first crosswind landing. Story 2. Once departing Burning Man in a private plane with a couple of passengers, my engine conked out. I didn't even follow the engine out checklist. I glanced at the fuel pressure gauge, didn't like what I saw, hit the switch for the auxiliary fuel pump, and it came back to life. The whole incident was over so fast, the passengers never even noticed. I wouldn't call it a, we're all screwed moment though. Worst case scenario, I would have had to set it back down. And we had pretty flat terrain as far as the eye can see. Story 3. I was in the process of getting my PPL, private pilot license, and I was flying circuits solo. Before I took off, the CFO of the flight school asked me if I was sure it was a good idea to fly. It's pretty windy. I was flying a Cessna 152 on the day, with wind pushing 15 knots and turbulence around 20. I honestly don't know what I or anyone at the flight school was thinking, letting me, 16-year-old, take off. Anyway, a few bumpy circuits go by with no problem. I actually got some great practice landing in turbulence. So the last circuit of the day I'm on final with full flaps doing the absolute minimum speed for approaching an A152, not taking into consideration that the air is super turbulent. For those who don't know, when it's bumpy you should be going a little faster on approach than usual. Anyway, I'm quite close to the ground, maybe 300-400 feet, and I can hear the wind blowing over the sound of the engine. Suddenly, no wind. I had just lost 15 to 20 knots of almost direct headwind on final approach, with absolutely no airspeed to spare. I remember my shirt sleeves looked like they were inflating, and the plane's stall warning started screaming at me. The controls became totally useless, like limp computer joysticks. Thankfully, I had my hand on the throttle like my instructor taught me, and for whatever instinctual reason, good instructor probably, I gently pushed the throttle all the way and slightly lowered the nose. All of this took place in the span of about five seconds. Seconds. I remember what I did, but not thinking about doing it. It was like when you drive somewhere and you suddenly realize you've arrived without remembering driving. Damn scary. Anyway, I landed the plane just fine and went home and took a nap. My parents said I was pale as a ghost when I got home. Flying is fun. Until it isn't. Edit. A lot of people are wondering why I gently pushed the throttle in. The reason is because the carburetor can't provide enough fuel to maintain the proper fuel slash air mixture. When the pilot rapidly pushes the throttle in, the carb is supposed to provide a quick squirt of fuel to account for the rapid increase in air. If the pilot slams the throttle to the firewall, the huge amount of air coming into the carb is simply too much for it to maintain the proper air-fuel mixture, even with the extra squirt. In the best case, this can cause the engine to lag for a few seconds while the mixture catches up. And in the worst, might actually cause the engine to stall completely. So imagine an inexperienced pilot who panics and really jams the throttle all the way. That may have a disastrous effect, because not only are they at low altitude with little airspeed, but they just choked their engine and simply can't get any more power. A good teacher can really make up for a lot of things, and can really set you up well for dangerous situations, as it did here. OP having that instinct to not just slam the throttle and also to do something with it in the first place, definitely, well, I'm not gonna say definitely, I'm not a pilot, but it sounds like it saved his life. Good work staying cool under pressure, OP. Story 4. This entire story occurred in less than 10 seconds, and should have ended with headlines on CNN. Military pilot and not commercial, but it still could have ended in a disaster. Flying a CH-47D Chinook helicopter in Iraq. Mid-July, 2008. The temp was over 130 degrees, packed full with 36 passengers at an altitude of only 100 feet, and a speed of 140 knots. Lower and faster than you'd ever fly in the US. We hit a thermal pocket of warm air that pushed us up. 
so I knows that the cyclic looks like a joystick between your legs forward to maintain altitude. I was a brand new pilot flying with a combat vet who wanted me to maintain altitude of 100 feet almost exactly, so no higher than 120 or lower than 80. Nosing the aircraft down kept us from going higher, but we immediately hit a downdraft, and the aircraft started to fall like a rock. I pulled back on the cyclic as hard as I could to get the nose up, but it hit my body armor and wouldn't go back any further. I watched the altimeter drop all the way to 19 feet, and miraculously we started falling and began to climb at the last possible second. During the debrief, the other pilot, now one of my closest friends who had well over a thousand combat hours, told me he's never been so close to dying before. I wasn't shook up until I heard that. Even typing this today gives me chills. Story 5. Mine is from many, many years ago when I was a student pilot. I was 14 at the time, I think. I had about 15 hours done and getting close to soloing for the first time, but still had a few hours and more landings to practice. I was doing some basics and getting ready to come back with my instructor to practice some touch and goes for a bit. Coming back through, we had to pass through DTW's Bravo airspace means need permission to go through it. A few minutes before I was about to call for permission, my instructor got really quiet. I looked over at him and he looked really bad. I thought he was going to puke. So I started looking for a bag, but then I notice he isn't breathing. I figure out where I'm at and call up DTW approach, declare a medical emergency and that my instructor was not breathing. I also told them I'm a student and never landed on my own before and never in a large airport. Detroit approach was amazing at helping me. They gave me an option for DTW or Willow, but Willow would have added a good 5 to 10 minutes since I was coming in from the southeast. Opted for DTW, and they were great at giving me vectors while also getting the big jets out of the way. I remember hearing them tell several planes to go around and several more into a hold. Anyway, did my approach and made the most butter smooth landing I've ever made in my life, even to this day. Ambulance was right there on taxi waiting for me. Turns out my instructor, who was only 25, had a heart attack. He ended up being okay. All in all, from first call to him in the ambulance was less than 10 minutes. All thanks to ATC and DTW Tower. Story 6 was learning to fly when I worked for the government. So on my first flight with me taking off, we've been climbing for about five minutes and we're going through some gentle turns. The instructor says, We're gonna head back. I don't feel well. He then takes over the stick and he looks ashen. He then starts to breathe erratically and says I need to help him control the plane. He radios tower and up until now I'm thinking it's a prank. Mayday. Mayday. He talks me through the whole thing. I'm trying to talk to the tower, repeat info, read gauges, remember lessons, listen him, and hope he doesn't pass out. I was crapping myself. Takeoff is one thing, but landing? We land like a kangaroo with a rocket up its butt. I'm surprised that the wheels didn't fold. Must have been four big bounces, but it's a big runway. Scrub speed. Finally get the plane to stop, and instructor passes out. He had a heart attack. He survived, but only for a few months. Before I heard, he passed away in his sleep. But he got us down. I never continued the lessons. Story 7. I'm a CFI at this point and I'm flying with a student. We see a spider in the cockpit. Now, I'm okay with spiders, but I don't want it distracting the student, so I mash it. Student missed the spider but saw my movements and asked what it was. I responded with, it was a spider. I got it, as I'm glancing into the backseat area. I managed to casually add, why, are you scared of spiders? Without the student noticing the break in the sentence. Turns out the student is scared of spiders. For the rest of that flight, I squished spiders from behind my student's back as they came forward from the nest I had just spotted in the back of the plane. He never knew. Now, I would hope in that situation, one's brain would prioritize the fear of dying by crashing a plane more than the fear of spiders. That being said, brains don't always work like that. OP did good here. And an unfortunate situation for the student. Yikes. Story 8. Not a pilot, but my buddy has a private license, and we fly together often, just for his hours. I buy lunch, he gets hours, it's fun. I live in the PNW, and he wanted to fly over to Crater Lake one winter. Ceiling, 8,000 feet. Crater Lake, 6,000 feet. He doesn't have his instrumental yet, so we can't break ceiling. We fly over, have an easy time, take great pics, etc. We get back to the airport, go to the bar, and he proceeded to tell me that was the most frightened he's ever been piloting. Why? The single engine Cessna we were in could glide two to three miles in an emergency. Crater Lake is eight plus miles in diameter. In the middle, we'd be screwed. I asked him what he would do. He said, I'd nosedive into the water. You want to swim in that stuff and drown, or die quick and mostly painless? FML. Story 9. There's never been a moment like this for me because you're always trying something else to save the plane. There's never been a real situation where I had to save a plane from imminent disaster. There's decisions I've had to make that if I chose wrong we could be in a bad spot, but never anything like we're all going to die. Once when landing in RJ on a short runway out in the northeast, 
I was carrying a little bit too much speed and caught a gust at the wrong moment. The plane lifted maybe 10 feet higher and I slowly lowered my nose. I realized at this moment that where the plane will touch down will not give me a whole lot of opportunity to stop before the end of the runway. As a matter of fact, it's probably not going to stop until we get into the trees at the end. I pushed the power up and we did a go around maybe 20 to 30 feet off the ground. The controllers vectored us around and we landed safely on try number two. In the simulator we do all the oh crap stuff, and even when a training event goes sideways, we still try to fly the thing until it hits something solid. I can't imagine ever giving up on the plane in flight. There are thousands of decisions made every day on flights by pilots that prevent a difficult situation from becoming dangerous. Flying these days is very cautious and conservative. Safety is always a first, and nothing is ever allowed to slide. Story 10. Not quite with passengers, but a screw-up nonetheless. During my first solo flight ever, I was really excited, and wanted to video record the special occasion. So there I was taxiing down the taxiway with one hand holding my phone. One thing about old propeller planes is that they're just like old cars. They don't always drive straight. I suppose I was a little too concentrated on making sure my camera was properly angled and focused, and next thing I knew my plane ended up rolling off the asphalt into the frickin' grassy ditch. I panicked. How the hell am I supposed to get this plane out of here? Over the radio, there was a silence, as the controller likely saw what happened from the tower. After a few seconds, probably still speechless at this point, she casually checked on me to make sure I was okay. To save my embarrassment, I tried to power up and drive out of the grass back to the asphalt. Much to my surprise, it worked. I did my short flying as planned and returned to the hangar where my instructor was waiting. I have no idea how many people saw what happened, but from the look on his face, I'm pretty sure he knew too. And yes, that video of me driving into a ditch exists. I suppose this is the airplane equivalent of don't text and drive. OP, if using a phone and driving is a bad idea, tell me, how did you think using a phone and flying, well, not flying, but at least controlling a plane was gonna go? This is a foolish decision. Get it all set up before you start taxiing, you fool. Story 11. I wasn't the pilot, but I was a passenger on a glider. For those who don't know, gliders can't get off the ground on their own. For this glider, we needed a tow plane, a 172. The 172 has a tow hook that they clip onto our nose. When we want to release, we go through a release procedure. The pilot in the 172 dips a wing to signal the release. He slows down. We dive. This creates slack. We nose up, then release the tow cable. The Cessna flies on its merry way, and we glide. Well, during the release procedure, something went wrong, and the cable couldn't be released. The glider pulled on the tail of the Cessna and caused a ton of chaos, as flying a 172 with a glider that isn't synced with your motions is incredibly hard. Luckily, we both made it back in one piece, but that could have very well caused the 172 to stall and crash and we would be dragged down with them, watching helplessly. Story 12. Long time ago, back in 1989, I was a first officer on the 747-100. We pushed back from the terminal in Anchorage and taxied out for departure to Narita, Tokyo. We were full of people, and very close to max takeoff weight. At the end of the runway, it was my takeoff, I stood on the brakes, stood the thrust levers up, and the engineer set full takeoff power, released the brakes, and off we trundled. And we rolled, and rolled, and rolled down the runway. It was not sparkling acceleration by any means. As the end of the runway loomed in sight and takeoff speed was still some distance away, with the lights going red, white, red, white, red, 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 the captain said, and I quote, Best you rotate. We were a good 20 knots below VR. Not being a total numpty, I slowly and smoothly rotated, and the beast flew away off the end of the runway like a lady. We slowly climbed away, cleaned up, turned, and headed out west. Not a word was said for a long while. Finally, through 20,000 feet, the engineer launched himself at the, my, performance figures. Nothing was wrong and we were at full power anyway. It turned out that extra cargo had been loaded in error and we were well overweight. Apart from me wetting the seat and a raised heart rate, the passengers were none the wiser. Story 13. I'm a commercial helicopter pilot. Probably the closest moment to where screwed I ever had was a few years ago. To set it up, I was ferrying a helicopter by myself to another location about 200 miles away. The helicopter I was flying was set up for IFR, instrument flying, and I'm a fairly experienced IFR captain. The helicopter I was in does not like ice. That means flying in clouds when it's below freezing is basically impossible. This was in the high Arctic in the early spring, so basically always cold. Weather wasn't great, but I still wanted to give the trip a shot. If it was bad, I could just turn around and come home. About 50 miles out, the cloud ceiling was coming down, and visibility was dropping. I was over a small, frozen lake, and I could see at the other end of the lake that the clouds were right to the ground. At this point, I'm at about 300 feet above ground. I make the call to turn around and start a left-hand turn, but as I'm halfway through, 
I enter a cloud. Under normal circumstances, a VFR helicopter unintentionally entering a cloud is often a death sentence. But I'm a trained IFR pilot in an IFR helicopter. I start a climb, as I know there's rising terrain on the side of the lake. I don't mind flying in cloud. What I do mind is the fact that my helicopter starts icing up instantly. Oh, I'm not talking about a bit of ice. I'm talking about a massive amount of ice. In a helicopter that, by the way, remember, doesn't like any ice. There is no way I can make it the 50 miles back to the airport to shoot an IFR approach. And I know the clouds are too thick to climb above them. I also can't descend because the ceiling is so low that I risk impacting the terrain if I don't pop out of the cloud soon enough. I'm running through the options in my head, but my heart rate is going up. This isn't something that normally happens. I'm not the type of pilot that gets into situations that scare me. I'm rapidly running out of time. So I head to a larger flat area, as indicated on my GPS and maps, set my radio altimeter, a device that tells you exactly how far above the ground you are, to beep at me when I reach 250 feet, and start descending. I figure if I don't break out by 300 feet, I'm in some serious trouble. As I'm approaching 300 feet, I break out of cloud. Good visibility and a clear path all the way back to the airport. I do a normal approach and landing and shut down at our hangar. The blades are covered in ice. After I change my underwear, we pull the helicopter into the hangar to let the ice thaw. The next day, the weather is beautiful and the trip goes off without a hitch. After flying for 10 years and thousands of hours, it was the only time I was actually scared. I'm just glad I didn't have any passengers on board at the time. Story 14. I was the passenger on the plane. It was my first time flying alone, so it was a big deal for me. Chicago to Tampa. The way there? Fine. The way back to Chicago? Oh, God. It was a boring commercial flight. The plane wasn't completely full, but it was quite a few people still. We were approaching Midway Airport, but something happened. There was a big bang and a huge, sudden drop. The plane then jerked up and away, and for some reason, we had to go to O'Hare instead. So we're over the lake and we're told to assume the crash position. I was 12. When the flight attendants are in their seats and in the crash position, I knew it was bad. The whole time, the plane is jerking and going up and down. Weightless one moment and then a jerk and normal feeling. We were so close to the water. I'm just thinking I want to see my family and everyone again. We are finally approaching O'Hare, and we see fire trucks and ambulances by the airport and watching that runway approaching so fast and just, the captain came on and said to brace for a very hard impact. The wheels were stuck, I guess. So somehow, somehow, we landed in a perfect glide without hitting anything. We did veer off across another runway and stopped in the grass. It was rough and bumpy, and the noise of the metal against concrete was like nails on a chalkboard times a million. But the only real damage was whatever failed, and the belly of the plane was banged up. But that's it. I was so far into fear that when I finally looked up, I saw the bins had opened and everything was everywhere. It was just silence. Then, everyone's cheering and hugging each other. Pilot comes on and says, Well, I think I give this roller coaster ride a two. Then, in seriousness, talks about the slides coming out and all that. We're all walking out and everyone is just shaking the pilot's hand. And it's my turn and I'm a hormonal, emotional 12-year-old and just hugged and cried. I was embarrassed after that, but he was just happy because I was a kid and I was okay. Then I got to go down the slide. Wee! Not as fun as you think. After everyone is checked out by paramedics, we get taken to a gate and we get in. And I'm looking around for my dad since he was the one supposed to pick me up. I hear him yelling my name and I'm screaming, Daddy, Daddy! Fiercest hug I ever got from him, and one of a handful of times I've seen him cry. He's doing that thing where parents check you all over like arms, legs, okay, no blood, are you okay, are you okay? I was the only kid on the plane, so people were cheering during all of this. My dad finds the pilot and shakes his hand thanking him. The pilot was just like, oh, I was just doing my job. We are leaving and my dad told me that when they announced the emergency over the system at Midway Airport, he never felt his heart drop so fast. This was back when you could meet people at the gate, so he suddenly said there was a bunch of people running. He took some other people with him because they had taken the bus to Midway. It's about a 45 minute drive from one airport to another. They were pulling in when the plane started to make its descent, so he pulled over and watched it land. Obviously, they didn't know the condition of the inside of the plane, but they had hope. Later, we got more details on what happened. A goddamn goose got sucked into the engine. Now, normally it wouldn't have done anything, but it was like a series of freak incidents after it happened. I don't remember the technical details, but I guess another engine failed and then the tail went awry. They 100% thought we were going to crash into the lake. That's why he changed course. It was either a residential area and us, or just us. They had grounded all planes meant to take off from O'Hare, so I'm assuming all eyes were on us from the tower. Somehow he managed to keep us high enough to avoid crashing. I don't know all of what he had to do, 
just that he should not have been able to make it. P.S. The dad found out what he and his co-pilot were making in a year and wrote a check for that amount. My parents and my sister and I took them to dinner and gave them their checks. The main pilot and I kept in touch. He's like a third uncle. Okay, everybody. I know what some of you are thinking. You heard the cheering part and you think it's a fake story. It's true. Everyone clapped and cheered is a pretty common meme to just be like, yeah, this totally happened. But I want to say I think there's a chance this story is real. And I'm just gonna go with it. Because is it not just more exciting and incredible to believe it's real? Why not, you know? A little suspension of disbelief for your Reddit readings. Story 15. I know this doesn't fit the thread at all, but I've been wanting to share this for years. It's actually the opposite in a lot of ways, but hey, I'm telling it. I was at work one day and this guy, known for telling great tales, calls a girl at my work as he's leaving SXSW. He tells her his plane might be going down. It spreads like wildfire throughout the company and I hear about it. So naturally, I think, <laughs> yeah, right, and bring up his flight on FlightAware to see a really, really messed up flight pattern. Anyway, his story went like this. They're just taking off and the right engine disintegrates. The captain comes on and says what happened and that they need to dump fuel and try to land. The try part comes from the fact that they're not sure if the engine took out the landing gear. At this point, everyone is panicking, and even the flight attendants are crying and freaking out. The captain comes back on and says to assume crash positions, which is basically putting your head down and kissing your butt goodbye. They land and all is good. What I saw on FlightAware was a plane take off and circle like eight times, then land. I couldn't even imagine that, and think about it every time I take off in a plane. The chaos and feelings my friend and everyone else must have experienced must have been intense. It never made it on the news. It was never reported, which only makes you wonder, how often does this stuff happen? Story 16. Obligatory, not an airline pilot, but I'm a private pilot, and know a handful of airline pilots. Most of the things that make you feel like you're gonna crash in a large jet slash turboprop are really not significant. Planes can handle way more turbulence than you fly through. That sound is probably normal, and the engine quitting doesn't mean you're gonna fall out of the sky. Go-arounds, where the plane aborts its landing, happen a handful of times a day at most airports. Nothing out of the ordinary. Flying on a US airline is one of the safest things you can do. You're more likely to die driving to the airport or even falling out of bed than you are in a large commercial airliner crash. Also, tarmac isn't any part of an airport, but rather a material that was used to make airport surfaces decades ago. Runways are where you land and take off. Taxiways where planes are moving and speaking with air traffic control. Ramp slash apron is where planes are parked and pushed back. Story 17. I'm an airliner pilot now, but my first job was flying banners. I have another good banner tow story, but I've told it before. I didn't have passengers, but I had viewers, and from their perspective, nobody noticed. One day, as usual, I was given the job of heading to a fairly distant location, unpacking and setting up my banner, and picking it up and flying it. Set up went like it usually does, and I took off to pick the banner up. In banner towing, the way it works is you've got a grappling hook at the end of a cable that's attached to the tail of the aircraft. You take off without the banner attached and come back around, swooping down steeply toward a loop of rope you've set up on the ground held up between two posts, running down to the banner. At the last second, you yank the plane skyward, and the hook is supposed to swing between the posts and hook the rope. On my pickup, I felt the satisfying pull of the banner as I leveled off. But something was wrong. It was pulling hard to the left side. A quick look to my left showed I had missed with the hook, and instead caught the banner rope loop with my left wheel. Even worse, instead of sliding up the gear leg to the fuselage, the rope had caught down near the wheel. I had been provided a steak knife for the purpose of cutting the rope, but there was no way I was going to be able to reach that rope. The plane was yawing hard, but it was under control, and I flew slow circles around the airport while I thought about my options. I could always try to land the plane with the banner attached, but from what I'd heard, that usually results in the plane tipping over onto its nose, ruining the engine and propeller at the very least, probably causing a lot more damage. Oh, and not to mention, risking my own life. I couldn't cut the rope because I didn't have the reach. Then I remembered what I did have. A small toolkit and a roll of duct tape in the pocket behind my seat. I thought about what I could do with those, and it occurred to me that the empty second seat behind me also had a metal tube control stick. Well, it'd be worth a shot. I controlled the plane with my knees while I reached behind my seat to get the toolkit. Only a single bolt and nut secured the control stick to the tube below, but I had to access it blind, reaching below and behind me while also controlling the plane. After a couple of guesses as to which size socket to put on the ratchet, I had a good grab, and managed to get the nut off and extract the screw. A brisk pull-up dislodged the control stick and oh my god it was working. 
The stick was a couple of feet long, and I figured it would be enough to reach out the window and down to the rope. Still, flying with my knees, I stuck the steak knife handle into the bottom end of the control stick and wrapped a bunch of duct tape around the joint, until I felt it would be secure. And it was time to give it a try. I lined back up for my pickup site and reaching as far out the left window as I could, while fighting the slipstream, I could just contact the rope. When I reached my target, I started sawing wildly at the rope but it sliced through with surprising ease. I felt the plane lurch as the banner dropped back down to the earth. I landed the plane and took a few minutes to breathe, thinking about what had just happened, and then what to do next. It occurred to me that I could tie a knot in the rope and just pick it up again, and that's what I did. Suffice to say, I was a bit more careful this time, and everything went as planned. From the ground, the only thing anyone would have noticed is that a banner plane picked up a banner and just stayed in the air for a while. Dropped the banner, picked it up again, and headed off. OP- okay, hold on. As someone with zero piloting experience at all, this sounds otherworldly. Like, what is going on? I can't even picture the scene in my head. I hope I did a good enough job narrating it that you people could, but I am lost. From what I understand, this dude be flying a plane, the banner gets caught up in the wheel, and he goes out of the plane while flying it with his knees and- I- I don't know. If someone could help me out in the comments, please do. Story 18. I'm so late to the party, but I've been looking for an explanation from a pilot to the experience I had on Embraer 145J from Newark to Albany one afternoon. Now, I've been on a lot of flights, especially that little hop, many times. I know what the normal sounds are, including what it sounds like when the engines cut out and it feels like someone hit the brakes. This was different. We took off like normal, but about a minute into the climb, the plane went dead silent, and we went into an abrupt nosedive for three to five seconds, which felt like eternity. At least seven people screamed. I clutched my armrest and made peace with the fact that this was finally happening. I always knew I would die in a plane crash. Miraculously, the engine suddenly kicked back in and we went right back into a sharp climb. Five seconds after, the exact same thing happened to us again. The plane's engines went silent, and we were pointing hard back at the earth. More people screamed this time, and it was louder than the first. Again, the engines turned on and we got back up to cruising altitude, but the whole flight was shaky. It felt slow. It really felt like we were about to drop out of the sky. There was a woman from Long Island in front of me, nervously talking to everyone. We landed in Albany with no explanation as to what happened. Most pilots I've ever asked shake their head in confusion, unsure as to what could have happened. One explanation was that there's a mandatory noise abatement protocol over certain neighborhoods in Newark. Oftentimes, they'll get clearance to not back the engines off. Possibly in this case, the pilot thought he would get the clearance, air traffic peeps said no, and made the pilot back off and drop back down to a certain altitude. And they did that in the worst way possible for non-pilot passengers. This sounds like BS to me, but it's all I have. This experience traumatized me a little bit, so a real explanation would be great. Well, I hate to say it, that's the last story we have, and it's not even really a story for the prompt. Sorry I don't have an answer for this one either. It's just this post. The mystery. What a fun way to end it. It does kind of sound like a, a dream, though. Or a nightmare, I guess. The fact it happened not once, but twice, would freak me the hell out. Also, if people were screaming, and the pilot knew something, and it wasn't a problem, they totally should have just said, right? Instead of leaving everyone in the dark and terrifying them for their freaking lives? Anyway, this sounds weird, and it kind of sounds like a fever dream from UOP, I'm not gonna lie. If it did happen, though, whew, I would not have liked to be on that flight. Traumatized doesn't even really sum it up. Anyway, as I said, last story. For now, thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day or night wherever you are, and I will see you in the next one.